Will everyone please welcome Steve Powell. Thank you. Architect-led design build. You, can, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. We are called to be architects of the future, not its victims. <laughs> These two quotes are from about 50 years ago from Buckminster Fuller, the genius that invented the geodesic dome. It sounds like it, it's a TED Talk topic that was given last week. But this was a comment regarding the state of the profession over 50 years ago. In, in 2017, Barbara Bison in the online magazine Design Intelligence kind of shook up the profession when she wrote an article entitled Future of Architects, Extinction or Irrelevance. That really shook up a lot of the uh, firm leaders in our profession. And I'm not going to read very much today, but I needed to read this. Architects have limited impact. Not only have we left the suburbs, strip centers, and the worst parts of town to others to shape, but we have let lawyers and insurers talk us into avoiding risk and retreating from responsibility. It has been estimated that 80% of the world is now built without architects. And thanks to our reluctance to embrace and manage risk, AIA contracts, architects contract for a smaller percentage of project responsibilities than ever before. The current limited scope of architects is in large part a result of being taught what to think rather than how to think about the design, business, and construction. So today I'm going to give us a peek behind the curtain of Powell Architecture and Building Studio. If, if you all are like us, we experience those times when we've had value engineering of our projects, where, where we can't serve our clients to the best of our ability because we no longer really have control of what is being built. And we decided there's got to be a better way to present and create our projects. So what I'm going to tell you today is a story about how we got to where we are and we're going to be able to take a look at some of the designs that we've done. But first, let's redefine what is a true architect. The, the Greek word architect comes from the meaning chief carpenter. And I can imagine for, for 3,000 years, we as architects are the ones that have been designing the buildings, going out and building the buildings, whether it be the Greek temples, the pyramids, or, or the great castles and cathedrals of Europe. We have for 3,000 years been the chief carpenter. But that all changed in the 1800s. Prior to the 1800s, anyone could be an architect. If you, if you had the desire to study, if you studied under uh, apprenticeship, uh, a mentor, if you read and, and had a patron that would we call them clients now. If you had a patron to hire you to do the work, you could be an architect. That changed in 1857. What happened in 1857? The AIA established. Now, now I, I, I'm very pro-AIA. Uh, it was mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the president of Middle Tennessee chapter. I'm drinking out of an AIA water uh, mug over here. So I am pro-AIA, but in the 1800s, 1857, there was a split. Now we have the gentleman architect and the makers and tradesmen. We split our chief carpenter definition of an architect into two 
brands. I went online and was looking for some examples of architects, and there was a uh, housing development in Phoenix, Arizona. And the housing development was designed by a real architect. And in, in the ad, you could tell he was a real architect. Uh, of course, he's dressed all in black. And, and I'll make this day, I was at an AIA meeting, and I was dressed mostly in black. Uh, the real architect, you can tell by his million dollar watt smile. And there's a, in the advertisement, there's a glow around him. And the individualist around the office uh, also wears all black. And there's a real contrast now to the maker's team who is wearing the hard hats and the safety vests. Well, our, our journey into architect-led design build started about 13 years ago. We, we were, like most of you, a, a design-only firm. Uh, I've been an architect for many years. We got a project to renovate an old, nasty house, which was turned into a hair salon, and we were going to turn it into a dental office. And, and I'll admit, we got a little carried away. We, we did a lot of 3D gymnastics, a lot of skewed walls. We really did a pretty elaborate job of designing the project. Um, but it was a design bid build project and a friend of ours was a general contractor. And what happened is every day in the project, unfortunately, was about four blocks from our office. It was too convenient. So every day we're over there helping the contractor figure out how to put our design together. We got to the point that we were even helping him figure out means and methods of construction against all AI contracts. So at the end of the project, we somewhat naively thought that if we're going to build, if we're going to spend so much time on site helping the contractor build these projects, why don't we, why don't we build them ourselves? It started out as a simple proposition. When we started to talk to some other architects about our idea of building the building ourselves, we said, well, what about that natural conflict between the contractor and the architect? The, the, the uh, balance because of the tension, you know, who's going to watch out for the good of the owner? Well, I, I call that the Hamilton dilemma because if we as architects have the ethics, the training, and the heart to see the whole project, and we have to watch out for the health, safety, and welfare of the public, can we not have the ethics to be the contractor itself? Uh, when you go buy tickets to Hamilton, are you concerned that uh, Lynn manuel Miranda is going to do a less job because he not only created and wrote the uh, play, but he's now starring in it as well. So th that, that's a false presumption that we as architects have to maintain that tension with the contractor to get up our projects built. So we, we looked at uh, the AIA's approach to teaming with an architect teaming architect and a contractor together and presenting a, a unified team to the owner. Well, the AIA comes up with some good uh, low risk, the pros, the contractor may help you with marketing. I don't know about you, but in the, in the 30, 40 years that I've been an architect, not many contractors have helped me with marketing. They're all my friends, too, in town. They say the G general contractor can be a financial source of security, and the GC gets better deals from the subs. Of course the general contractor gets better deals from the subs than the architect typically would. They're hiring them all the time. 
That's where the cash money is coming from. The con the AI mentions with the teaming approach is it's hard to explain to the owner, and I've had to do that before, where you explain to the owner that, yeah, I'm leading the project, you know, but I'm not really building the building. Well, the owner wants to turn around and say, let me talk to who's really building the building, because that's who I need to communicate with. I, I've worked with a number of firms, and the teaming approach always comes down to splitting the profits of the project. You know, if the contractor does the work and the architect does the work, who's making the profits and who's actually going to keep the profits. So th that one point really has destroyed many teaming approach uh, projects. So we thought some more and we thought there's got to be a different way. Uh, the typical architect, contractor, owner relationship, there's a wall built between the contractor and the architect so that communication is, is stymied. Uh, in, our, in our book that we've published on our work, we use this diagram with all the wiggles because we know in many of our projects, uh, consultants and, and subcontractors end up communicating with one another. The, the, the wall that we have to uh, build between people to maintain the RFI, the request for information process, just slows everything down. So we thought, well, if the better way is to bring into a single entity, one entity, that has both the architecture and the construction. And with our training as architects and our ability to solve problems, to communicate, who else is in the best position to be in that singular central role of having a building built? And then all the, uh, the round consultants and the square Subcontractors all have a single point of contact, and that is the master builder, the chief architect. So with that approach in mind, our next step in our office was to say, okay, are we ready to take this risk? Because as architects, you know, we're trained to avoid risk. Gee, we, uh, we, we uh, don't talk about job site safety. We don't make any guarantees. That's what the contractor does. We have architects, we do general estimates of the construction cost of the building. And I love this one. When I visit a job site as an architect, remember, I'm only looking for general observation. So we've limited our, our, our liability as an architect. But if we're going to be a single source for the owner, we're going to have to accept that we take full responsibilities. Sometimes we have to guarantee the price. I'll tell you, typically we work cost plus open book where everything is disclosed to the owner. So rarely in our firm do we have to guarantee a price. But we have done a couple of projects with the GMP full-time site inspection. Now we're a single entity, entity that is responsible for everything that is going on in that site. So we have full liability for design and construction. Had a good interview uh, discussion with Peter Gluck, Gluck Plus up in New York. I look to them as our mentors because they're doing fantastic work as architect-led design build firm. And Peter told me uh, when I was asking about risk, he says, there's no such thing as getting rid of risk. We as architects want to eliminate and have no risk. He said, control your risk. And he gave me two words of advice for it. Insurance and surround yourself with expertise. 
So that, that is how you can control your risk and just accept the fact you're never going to eliminate it. The, our next step to, to go on our crusade to be a design build firm was to kind of understand just the pieces and parts of putting it together. And, and those of you who, who, who have your own architecture firms run into many of these same issues. So it's nothing new. You, you've got your business issues, your accounting issues, your staffing issues, uh, whether you're an architect as a PLLC or a contractor as an LLC. Those are, those are just steps you have to go through to set up and establish yourself as a uh, architect and contractor. And realistically, th this step of going through these uh, operational issues took us about a month and a half, two months to set up. We got our accounting software together. Uh, by the way, I, I, I was uh, advised, and it turned out true, contractors are really accounting firms that have to build because they're constantly tracking costs and manpower and the, the, uh, the building uh, issues. Uh, one, I want to mention, though, one of the unique things that challenges us as master builders is the staffing. Because you have to have the combination of the creative architects plus the detail-oriented project managers, plus the business-minded people, all working together in harmony. That is challenging, because everybody's coming from different personality types. So as we started into this process, the firm culture and what we wanted to be as a firm, what at our heart, what were we, what kind of firm were we, were we, was one of the most critical decisions we made. Contractors exam. When architects think of, of the exam, I don't know about you, I get night sweats from the process I went through for the architecture license. It is not like that. The contractor exam, is administered by a third party. You can go to a testing center, uh, take the exam that comes. In Tennessee, it's two parts, the law section and the construction section. And here's something I didn't realize until I got into it. It's open book. They, they, they tell you what books to buy. They tell you what books you can take into. Every question is somewhere in those books. So, uh, a little thing, uh, you, don't, you can take the two parts, split them up because it's a long day to take it all in one day. But even, here's my advice, even if you are not going to consider pursuing becoming a master builder, study and take the contractor's exam. I've become a better architect having gone through that process. Like many of you have become better architects by going through the process of the architectural license exam. Oh, you also know right away before you leave the building whether you passed or not. So we've gotten all of our pieces and parts in place. We've got our business set up. We've got uh, our commitment. We bought our insurance. That took about seven months to do. It was fairly quick. As soon as we had it all set up, our first client comes to us. They had a restaurant bar in East Nashville, about a half mile from our office. And they said, we didn't even have to market them. They said, with our experience in the past, we don't want all this infighting between the contractor and the architect. We want one person that we can come to if there's an issue. So we did the 308 bar project. It was a nasty space. It, there was shag carpet glued to the walls behind the, behind the drywall when we did the demo. The, 
The project value was about $300,000, so we knew we weren't taking a tremendous risk in our, uh, our first trial attempt of design build. And, and believe me, we learned a lot of lessons on this first project. I, I learned how to sweep a job site. I know how to work a broom now. <laughs> but we went through that, successful, and ended up opening it. Uh, National Scene that year uh, awarded it the uh, best bar in Nashville. Uh, they've done tremendous uh, uh, business. It's been in business now for 10 years and they're rebranding it now to continuing it in business. So it was a very successful project for the owners. Uh, when we demoed out the ceiling, we discovered uh, boat trusses up there. So we increased the volume and really changed the look of the place. I talked about peeking behind the curtain. I'm going to let you guys see the inner sanctum of our office now. Now, I need to say these, let me word this. These numbers are examples only. They are not real. We are not doing any cost and number uh, antitrust violations. Okay. Now that I've said all that, the antitrust police cannot come after me, but I want to disclose to you, if we've got a million dollar construction project that client comes to you and we're the architect, uh, let's just say we get a 6% fee, we get $60,000, our consultants with their percentages, they get 21,000 of that 60,000. So as an architect on a million dollar project, I get $39,000 of fee for myself. I make a 15% overhead profit, I made $5,850 on that million dollar project. Okay, I'm on the design building. I still get the architect's fee of $5,800. Now, I, I also am the general contractor, and I'll get an 8% overhead profit on the million dollar construction cost. I get $80,000. Now, the $85,000 for the design build master builder versus the $5,800 for the architect. Who wants to be on the architect team and who wants to be on the design builders team? Now, remember, with the overhead and profit too, a lot of the superintendent costs, management costs, are actually rolled into division one of the construction contract. Sure, the contractor may have additional overhead with an estimator, some insurance, and other issues as well. But you're going to compare $85,000 to $5,000. Okay. Again, these are examples only, not real numbers, okay, for antitrust purposes. So that was our first project. We survived it and about broke even. We decided to go full speed into design build work. And we have our um, uh, second edition of our book now that we give all of our prospective clients. And in it, we list out the uh, design and construction sequence, and everybody's used to the uh, pre-design, schematic design development, construction documents, permitting. But what we do is then we budget all throughout the project in-house, our estimating team budgets the project, so we are designing the project throughout the entire process to the client's budget. So when it goes out to permitting, and bidding to the subs, we're within 5% or less of the actual final construction cost. So there's no surprises for the client, no value engineering, because we've done it throughout the project. Our firm is very flat in its organization. We've got uh, five partners. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, we've got uh, architecture, the director of architecture. Uh, Katie Vance is our director of interior design, who was just awarded the uh, uh, 
State of Tennessee IIDA Designer of the Year Award for her interior design. We have uh, Chad in charge of construction. Uh, Luke does management and business development, and I do a little bit of everything. Our, uh, we, have, we have seven in our design and interior staff. And we're growing. Our construction staff, we have eight. Uh, that includes superintendents and uh, estimating. And we have two office accounting staff. Uh, my wife, Sharon, is our office manager and can't handle the front desk. Plus, we have a part-time bookkeeper that comes in once a week and an accountant that comes in once a month to check all of our books and make sure all of our taxes and everything is done correct for the year. I, I mention all that because we are not a large firm. We've kept it very flat. And that is part of the firm culture that is so critical that I mentioned earlier. We use the word studio in our name, Powell Architecture uh, uh, and Construction Studio, because we run it very much like the studio you would see back in school. Uh, we're probably as messy, as noisy, and disorganized at times in our office. And by the way, the white building in the foreground is our office. Uh, we're outgrowing it now, but uh, this was a half a city block in downtown Nashville. It's actually in East Nashville. That used to be a uh, fluffle mattress factory. We, we've redesigned, reworked, and uh, rebuilt the entire half city block, and we have our office in the corner of it. I will mention that in 2015, we did 2.1 million in uh, gross billables, architecture and construction, when we were first starting out doing our uh, design build. In 16, 4.5, in 2017, 6.2, 2018, 14 million. This last year, we've done about 19 million, and for uh, 2020, we have about 30 million on our books. So we're almost doubling our revenue every year for the, for the last five years. This is a typical project that uh, has come to us and it really shows the attributes of being a single source design build firm. Uh, this is an old boiler room of a laundry factory in downtown Nashville that laid dormant for about 20 years. Nobody knew what to do with this place. It was in the middle of the building at 85 foot tall, clear height to the roof. It included the bottom portion of what was the largest freestanding smokestack in southeastern United States. And there were five levels to the space. Nobody could figure out what to do with it. So they brought us in, and we turned it into Old Glory, uh, added a, a, a curved stairway to connect some of the spaces, and actually um, worked with the lights, worked with the uh, uh, existing uh, boiler equipment, uh, left a lot of it in place and it is a uh, very popular bar in, in Nashville. It, I guess this is what they do with uh, very popular places. They don't even put a sign out front. All they have is a triangle on the door. And they, that's, that's how you know where to go. Um, it's very difficult to see in the lower right-hand corner is the original space, and it was in pretty rough shape. But it turned out pretty well. Um, we've done this one maybe uh, six, seven years ago, and it really started to help our reputation for taking tough projects that other architects and other contractors shied away from. We just finished this uh, about four months ago. We finished the Russell, uh, a 1904 Romanesque church in East Nashville about 20 years ago, the, herd, the uh, tornado came through East Nashville, knocked off the right-hand uh, steeple, and blew out all the windows in the church. 
except for the two rose windows, survived. But when we got the project, uh, every window was boarded up with plywood. Uh, the, the brick was having a uh, needing repair. We ended up putting a new roof on the place, uh, reworking all the exterior brick, uh, landscaping, parking lot. But then when we went inside the building, in the lower left-hand corner, maybe difficult to see in the back, the, there wasn't a level surface in the entire church. The, the main body of the church was a sanctuary with a sloped floor and had curved laminated beams in the basement to handle the curve of the church floor. So we, we had to really rebuild the whole church in, in, internally. We uh, demoed out the suspended uh, drywall ceiling in the sanctuary, which was just hung by wires. Otherwise, we couldn't install new ductwork or mechanical in place. And we actually opened up the volume of the church with the concept that um, now we're going to have rooms within the volume of the church. So one of the penthouse rooms actually has a balcony, and the adjacent room, which is the tower room, also has a balcony within the volume of the church. Um, and you can see there's the two rose windows were restored, and the color scheme throughout the interior of the church was based on the colors of the rose window. As a single source design builder, about halfway through construction, we busted through one of the walls adjacent to the tower and found that there was a tremendous volume of space inside the tower. So we were able to add a bedroom to one of the units that's 10 by 10 by 30 foot tall ceilings inside the tower of the church. And the other thing we did about halfway through construction was going up through a hole in the ceiling into the attic space of the church, bat infested. We had to wear hazmat suits to get up there. Um, it was <laughs> the, the right hand corner picture shows my first photograph of standing up in the space and there's dust all over the place, bats are flying and it, it, you get choked up. Anyways, we were able to figure out that you could fit five more hotel rooms up into the volume of the attic space, which had a, in the pink, had a 28 foot tall ceiling. So we put, we added uh, skylights to the roof, perimeter rooms with a central uh, space, and uh, you actually walk amongst the trusses and turnbuckles of the attic original structure to get to your room. And, and the lower left hand picture is the original room where we built a staircase leading up into the tower bedroom. Last year we finished uh, the Green Pheasant restaurant. This is almost on the other end of the spectrum. It's in the first floor of the 222 building that was just completed in downtown Nashville across the street from the Senate Amphitheater. Uh, we went into the space uh, which was about 22 foot tall and was able to insert a um, mezzanine level of the restaurant. We uh, totally built it out. It was a really high-end restaurant, and uh, we got a, uh, another award for this one as well. The Cordell we did uh, a, a few years ago, that started out like some of our typical projects. In the lower left-hand corner was the original plywood secured windowed uh, brick house from about 1910, I think it was. The uh, roof had collapsed in the back. The uh, pigeons had taken over. Again, we seem to be wearing hazmat suits to a lot of our projects, but the uh, pigeons had taken over. Uh, the site was just all in disarray. We came in and created a structural frame on the 
original house portion to stabilize the house. Then we added onto the back a um, event space, and now uh, a lot of weddings are held there. Uh, the previous three uh, AI Design Award uh, presentations were held in the space. And uh, we specifically designed the lawn on the side of the space to fit a standard wedding venue tent. So they can also then expand wedding venue events outside. We just finished this project uh, oh, about six months ago, Oku Restaurant. Uh, we, after doing the original 308 bar, uh, we were very fortunate to time how Nashville has become kind of a foodie city. Lots of restaurants are opening up. And just our reputation from that first restaurant and our second and the third, we are now known in Nashville for doing a lot of restaurants. And uh, the owners of restaurants usually have had a bad experience in the past and come to us because of that single source responsibility. Uh, a 1960s one bedroom hotel uh, near Vanderbilt, uh, we, we totally got it and uh, refurbished into a uh, boutique hotel with a bocce club. This is a restaurant that is actually next door to our office in part of the uh, fluff up factory. Again, the uh, boat trusses opened up the ceiling. This restaurant is interesting because a lot of, a lot of clients will come to you and say, I, I want to feature the, the chef preparing the meal. I, I want to see into the kitchen. Well, what we did is we pulled the entire kitchen out into the middle of the restaurant, and now the chef can be preparing your meal, and you can be sitting at the counter watching them prepare the meal and uh, with all the ovens right behind them. We uh, did the design only of the shell. At that time, we had a uh, uh, 750,000 limit to our license. We're now an unlimited licensed general contractor. So we did not build the shell, but we designed the shell. Underneath there is a two-story metal warehouse that we tried to save as much of the structure and as much of the floor plate as possible and uh, then we expanded up the building and we did design and build out all the retail spaces inside of it. So that was a, a nice perk. With, with all those projects done um, and preparing for this talk today, I'm thinking, okay, what, what's the, the marketing? What, what have we done from a marketing standpoint to get this ball rolling? And really, I think the key of offering the single service to the client has been our strongest attribute because a lot of our clients have come to us, they call us because they know on their past project, it was nothing but the architect and contractor pointing fingers at each other when things go south. So our pitch to our clients are, if something goes wrong, there's only one, you only need one finger to point to then that will handle all your uh, uh, situations. When we talk with other firms, when we're, when we're uh, interviewing for a project, uh, which is rare, fortunately they come to us, but every, every firm likes to tell we're good designers. If we, if we weren't architects, you know, what would we be? Everybody is a good designer. So, you have to have a strong story beyond, hey, we're, we're good designers. And I think the, the uh, story of master builder really resonates with our clients. We do, and like everybody, we do the typical marketing tools. We, we have our book, we have our online presence, uh, but it's mostly reputation, word of mouth, and previous clients recommend, recommending us to other clients 
that has been really our source of most of our work. If I had to do it over again, yeah, I would do it over again. I, I, and I try to look at pros and cons. And every time I listed a pro, there was a con aspect to it. Every time I listed a, a, a con, there was pros. So really, they're the same thing. The pros and cons, yes, we have greater control of the whole process. But that's also then greater responsibility for that process. So we enjoy that. Uh, financial reward. Yes, there is greater financial reward being the master builder single source. There is risk involved. You, you, you know, and I'll go back, the risk involved in being the architect as well. You, know, you, you can have a strong contract, but if I have a stronger lawyer, I'm going to break your contract and go after everything that you own. You know, so it, it comes back to taking responsibility and controlling the risk. Um, I, I like this. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's a continuous, lifelong learning. I'm still learning uh, after doing this for a number of years. And I think that's really a strong point that I hope everybody takes to heart that whether it's taking the uh, contractor's exam for the experience or trying some new project delivery methods or trying some things in your firms, life is a lot more exciting when you're continuously learning about something. I feel like I have a greater impact in our community and on the profession by doing what we do and in some ways, hopefully encouraging all of you to, to seriously consider doing the Master Builder. I, I, I'll, I'll, I call it Master Builder. Be the architect. Be the chief carpenter of your projects. Um, back to our first slide. We can no longer afford to be reactive after the 2008 recession that hit, I think, everybody very hard. Hit, hit hard in Nashville, it hit harder in Atlanta, I'm not sure how it did in Knoxville, but we have got to evolve and develop new methods and, and processes for the building industry and our profession because someday another recession is going to come. And how are we going to react to that? Finally, you know you've made it when you get your name on a dumpster on a job site. And uh, you go around and you come up to this and then, okay. Um, I'd like to thank you for all your attention. Is there any questions?